In this video, we'll review Chapter 35, America in World War II. The Allies traded space for time during this time period, and under the ABC-1 agreement with England, the United States widely pursued getting Germany first as a strategy. Time was the most needed munition. Expense was no limitation. The America's problem was to retool itself for all-out war production before Germany could crush the English and the Soviets and before German scientists might develop any secret weapons. America's task was to feed, clothe, and arm itself, to transport its forces to regions as far separated as Britain and Burma, to send vast amounts of food and munitions to hard-pressed allies who stretched all the way from the Russia to Australia. National unity was no worry at this time period after Pearl Harbor. American communists had denounced Anglo-French imperialistic war of World War II prior to mid-1941, but now clamored for an assault on the Axis powers following Pearl Harbor. Pro-Hitlerites in the United States melted away, and millions of Italian Americans and German Americans loyally supported the nation's war programs. World War II speeded the assimilation of many of these ethnic groups into American society. No government witch hunting of minority groups took place. This is a picture showing America on the brink. A worker in San Francisco reads about America's impending entrance into the war after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. The painful exception was the plight of the 110,000 Japanese Americans, mainly on the Pacific coast. The government forcibly herded them into concentration camps using executive order number 9066. Internment deprived these Americans of dignity and basic rights. The internees lost hundreds of millions of dollars in property and foregone earnings, and the Supreme Court in 1944 upheld the constitutionality of Japanese relocation in Korematsu versus the United States. In 1988, the U.S. government officially apologized and paid reparations of $20,000 to each camp survivor. The war prompted changes in the American mood. Many New Deal programs ended as a result, and the era of the New Deal was over. World War II was not an idealistic crusade like World War I. The U.S. government put the emphasis on action. This is a picture called The Four Freedoms by Norman Rockwell. Freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. This is an anti-Japanese poster during World War II, which was government propaganda that was exploiting racial, st racial stereotypes, often depicting Japanese people with big teeth and p poor vision. Building the war machine. American, the American econ economy snapped to attention, and a massive military orders, massive military orders, over $100 billion in 1942 alone, soaked up the idle industrial capacity. The War Production Board was created, and this halted the manufacture of non-essential items, such as passenger cars, and prioritized transportation and access to raw materials. It imposed a national speed limit and gasoline rationing to conserve rubber, and built 51 synthetic rubber plants. By the war's end, these plants were outproducing the pre-war supply. This is a picture of Japanese-American evacuees in 1942. This is a picture of three boys at Manzanar, which was an internment camp. Farmers increased their output during this time period, and the armed forces drained farms of workers. Heavy investments in machinery and improved fertilizers more than made up the difference. In 1944 and 45, the farmers hauled in a record-breaking billion bushel wheat harvest. Economic strains were evident as well, but they started to reduce as full employment and scarce consumer goods fueled sharp inflationary surges in 1942. This was also a campaign against the Japanese in Hollywood, California in 1923 showing before the Japanese Americans were interned during World War II as a security risk, they still faced intense discrimination throughout the United States. The Office of Price Administration was created as well, which eventually brought prices under, the, under control with extensive regulations. Rationing was held down, rationing held down consumption of critical goods, though some black marketers and meat leggers cheated the system. The National War Labor Board imposed ceilings on wage increases.
Labor conditions during this time period showed that union membership increased from 10 million to more than 13 million during the war. Labor resented the government-dictated wage ceilings. The rash of labor walkouts plagued the war effort, though, and United Mine Workers were prominent among the strikers. They were called off the job by Union Chieftain John Lewis. The smith Connolly Strike Act was passed in June of 1943, which authorized the federal government to seize and operate these tied-up industries. Strikes against any government-operated industry was made a criminal offense, and Washington took over the coal mines and, for a brief time, the railroads. These stoppages accounted for less than 1% of total working hours of the United States wartime laboring force. Workers, on the whole, were committed to the war effort. There was manpower and woman power during this time period, and armed service enlistments increased by 15 million men in World War II. 216,000 women were employed for non-combat duties. They were called women in arms, and there were different groups for women to participate in. There was the Women's Army Corps, the Women Accepted for Volunteer Emergency Services for the Navy, and the SPARS, which was the U.S. Coast Guard Women's Reserve. Millions of young men clothed, were clothed in GI, government-issue, outfits. Certain industrial and agricultural workers were exempted from the draft, but there was still a shortage of farm and factory workers. The Bracero program was put into effect during this time period, and Mexican agricultural workers called Braceros came to harvest fruit and grain crops of the West. This program outlived the war by some 20 years, becoming part of the agricultural economy in many Western states. This shows uh, two pictures of workers in wartime and beyond, showing that many women entered the war effort by helping with production, but then there were people who were not for women working after the war either. More than six million women took jobs outside the home. Over half had never worked for wages before. Government was obliged to set up 3,000 daycare centers to care for Rosie the Riveter's children. And at the end of the war, many women were not eager to give up their work. The war foreshadowed the eventual revolution and roles of women in American society. Yet many women did not work for wages in the wartime economy, but continued in traditional roles. And at the war's end, two-thirds of the women war workers left the labor force. Many were forced out by returning servicemen, but many quit jobs voluntarily because of family obligations. The widespread rush into the suburban domesticity and mothering of the baby boomers was prominent during this time period, or the time period following the war. There were also migrations and demographic changes during this time period. Many men and women in the military decided not to return to their hometown at the war's end. The war industry sucked people into boom towns like Los Angeles, Detroit, Seattle, and Baton Rouge. California's population grew by 2 million, and the South experienced dramatic changes as well. They received a disproportionate share of the defense contracts. The seeds of the post-war Sun Belt was established during this time period. This map shows international, internal migration in the United States during World War II. Some 1.6 million blacks left the South for jobs in war plants of the no North and West. Forever after, race relations constituted a national, not a regional issue after this migration. Explosive tensions developed over employment, housing, and segregated facilities. <clears throat> Pushed by Randolph, Roosevelt issued the executive order forbidding discrimination in the defense industries, and they established the Fair Employment Practices Commission to monitor compliance with this edict. The blacks were drafted into the armed forces as well and assigned to service branches rather than combat units. They were subjected to petty degradations. They had segregated blood banks for the wounded. But the war helped embolden blacks in their long struggle for equality. The slogan, Double V, which was victory over dictators abroad and racism at home, became prominent. Membership in the NAACP shot up to the half million mark, and the new militant Congress of Racial Equality was committed to nonviolent direct action in 1942. This shows segregation in the military during World War II and the famed Tuskegee Airmen. The northward migration of African Americans was accelerated after the war thanks to the advent of mechanical cotton pickers, which were introduced in 1944, and the machine did the work of 50 people at about one-eighth of the cost. The Cotton South's historic need for cheap labor 
disappeared, and some five million black tenant farmers and sharecroppers headed north in the decades after the war. One of the great migrations in American history, as this was called, the Great Migration. And by 1970, half of the blacks lived outside of the South, and urban became almost a synonym for black. The war prompted the exodus of Native Americans from reservations. Thousands of men and women found work in major cities, and thousands more went into the armed forces. Ninety percent of Indians resided on reservations in 1940, and six decades later, more than half would live in cities and mainly in Southern California. 25,000 men served in the armed forces, and Native Americans served as code talkers. They transmitted radio messages in native languages which were incomprehensible to the Germans and the Japanese. This rubbing together of cultures created some violent friction. For example, in 1943, Mexican Americans in Los Angeles viciously were attacked by Anglo sailors. The brutal race riot in Detroit is another example where 25 blacks were killed and nine whites. This is a picture of the Navajo Code Talkers, 1943, which was one of the best-kept secrets of World War II. Overall, Americans at home suffered little. The war invigorated the economy and lifted the country out of the decade-long depression. The gross national product rose from $100 billion in 1940 to more than $200 billion in 1945. Corporate profits rose from $6 billion in 1940 to almost twice that amount four years later. So despite the wage ceiling, disposable personal income more than doubled with overtime pay. This was a picture of demanding the double V, where a Chicago man is picketing the discriminatory hiring at the local daily dairy supplier. This reflected the rising militancy of African Americans in the World War II era. The hand of the government touched American lives more than ever before. The roots of the post-45 era of big government interventionism took hold. Households felt the constraints of the rationing system. Millions worked for, government, for the government in the armed forces, and millions worked in the defense industries. The Office of Scientific Research and Development was created and channeled hundreds of millions of dollars into university-based scientific research. They established partnerships because the government and the universities underwrote America's technological and economic leadership in the post-war era. Government dollars swept unemployment from the land and the war, not an enlightened social policy, cured the depression. 1941 to 1945 is known as the origins of the warfare welfare state. World War II was phenomenally expensive. The bill amounted to more than $330 billion, 10 times the cost of World War I, and twice as much as all previous federal spending since 1776. Roosevelt would have preferred a pay-as-you-go, but the cost was simply too gigantic. The income tax net expanded, and some rates rose as high as 90%. Only two-fifths of the war bill were paid from current revenues, and the remainder was borrowed. So the national debt skyrocketed from $49 billion in 1941 to $259 billion in 1945. When production slipped into high gear, the war cost was about $10 million an hour. This was the price of victory over such enemies. This figure shows the national debt from 1930 to 1950. 